So it's time for local election reaction now with the former Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng. And despite a ballot box wipeout for the Tories over the weekend, it seems confidence of a Labour majority at the next general election remains low. So Labour gained 536 council seats across the country, while the Conservatives hemorrhaged 1,061 to lose control of 47 local authorities. But the polling expert of polling experts, John Curtis, predicts Keir Starmer's woke army would bag 312 seats in Parliament based off that performance, leaving them 14 short of an overall majority. Now, Labour themselves also appeared to be pricing in a hung Parliament if this clip of Wes Street in the Shadow Health Secretary refusing to rule out a pact with the Lib Dems is anything to go by. Would you rule out a coalition with the Lib Dems? Um, we're, not, we're just not in that ballpark of talking about coalition governments. What we are talking about, which is why we did well, cutting the cost of living, cutting NHS waiting lists, cutting crime with policies that saw people come to Labour on Thursday night. Now, I've been warning of a coalition of chaos for months now, whether it's with the SNP, Lib Dems, Greens or even the Corbynites and a divided Labour. Britain is in danger of being plunged into a socialist nightmare. So former Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng, great to have you here. Lots to unpick yeah. in, in terms of these historically bad election results. But can we talk about uh, this potential coalition of chaos first? Because this is really concerning, isn't it? Because Streeting was not prepared to rule it out there. And you just know if it means getting power, it won't just be the Lib Dems that they jump into bed right. with. It will be the Greens, it will be the SNP, and also... What about the hard left of the Labour Party, the Corbynites? They'll have to be on board too. Yeah, I think, Dan, you're 100% right. I mean, I remember going into 2015 and David Cameron said it was either the Tories or Coalition mm. of Chaos and the Conservatives won a majority. Mm. And I think the Coalition of Chaos that threatens in 2024 is a lot worse than what was uh, on offer in 2015. Because, as you say, you've got the SNP... And they're already horse trading. They're already mm -hmm. saying what their, their points are. They want a coalition and we know they, what and, they would demand. They would demand a referendum mm -hmm. on uh, the Scotland being part of the UK. You have the Liberal Democrats who are already positioning themselves and horse trading. And I read a report saying that they want a referendum on Brexit yeah. as a condition to support this, uh, this coalition. And you've got Greens, you've got a whole range of other people. Uh, and as you say, you've already got the you've got the Corbynites who were never properly defeated because no, Labour's divided, uh, and parties. they're still they're still there, and they will be flexing their muscles. So the prospect of this kind of left coalition uh, is pretty bleak. Exactly, which is why the Conservatives need to start performing. But mm. but quasi, I mean, this was a disastrous result. Now we had a debate earlier in the show mm. about who is to blame for this because mm. you've got the Sunak camp, mm. frankly, wanting to blame people like you. Mm, mm. They are saying this is all down to the Boris and Trust right. administrations. Your response to that Look, is? Look, I, I, I'm, I'm always, as you know, a loyalist. I've had five prime ministers. I can't even remember how many there have been, but I think it's five. <laughs> and I've been loyal to every single one of them. I've never spoken publicly against any of them. And I think Rishi Sunak did have a difficult uh, uh, time. I think he has had a difficult job, but at some point he's going to have to own what's actually happening. He's been there for six months. He steadied the ship admirably. I think he's got a great temperament. I've always thought that about him. We haven't always agreed, but I regard but him as a friend. He's not an election winner, is he? He's a technocrat. You know, on the doorstep, if you, if you read the reaction that folk mm. were having to Sunak, they were saying, look, we could believe in Boris. We sort of understood what he Boris was, was all a about. Formidable, I mean, I was always a big supporter of Boris. Boris was a formidable and amazing election. Don't you need him election. Uh, No, look, uh, this is where I am. I think he is, there's no doubting his electioneering skills. Mm. And I saw them in London yeah. in 2008 and particularly in yeah. 2012. He was awesome. He's formidable. Um, but, you know, the party saw fit to get rid of him. Um, and having got rid of him, we've had one prime minister that lasted seven weeks. Mm. Now we've had Rishi, who's, I think, been there six months. And you've got to give the guy his due. I think he's. I think he's got the calmness and the temperament to be a leader, even with this catastrophic to be a leader. result. And I think what he will do, which is the right thing, is not panic. We can't panic. The last thing we stay can do, the course. The last thing we can do is, or the worst thing we can do, is simply to just overreact mm. and panic and have another leadership contest and all the rest of it. And I can tell you, there isn't any appetite for that. But having said that, he's going to have to have an attractive offer 
next year. Yes. And ahead to, of the election. And we need to talk about that now because, mm. look, you lost your job mm. because of your bonfire of taxes. Now, That's right. I am very prepared to say I celebrated mm. that bonfire of taxes. Look, we've discussed before. We have. Maybe the communication was bad. Maybe All some of, of it things. was too fast. But at the end of the day, people are not going to vote, quasi, are they, for a high-tax, big-state Conservative Well, that class. was always my position. I mean, that's why I didn't back uh, Rishi in the leadership. I had a mm. very clear view that we were, the tax burden was too high. Now, I understand the reasons why he and Jeremy are sticking to this course, and it's very much a kind of OBR, you know, Treasury-type mm. view. That, um, the orthodoxy. Uh, yeah, I get, I get all of that. And given what happened last uh, autumn, you know, I've got to put my hand up and say... You know, there were things that we didn't we didn't get right. Um, I think we've got to be mature enough uh, to be able to to admit that. Uh, but going into the election next year, there has to be mm. an offer, and I'm sure there will be because you, you can't simply go into that offer so, saying it's so that election got, saying we're going to increase you've taxes. You've got colleagues like John Redwood, yeah. saying no, no, no. You've got to announce tax cuts now, yeah. Rishi. And you know, Redwood is is not a hater of Rishi. No, no, Sunak. not at all, not at all. But and he's do been you very agree, consistent. Do you agree with him? D does there have to be a tax cut announcement now? No, I don't. I don't think there has to be now. But there has to. What I say, there has to be, um, and what we must see is some kind of offer, mm. some kind of hope. He can't go into the election next year, whenever it is, saying I'm going to increase taxes. He can't. That that doesn't. That won't. That won't resonate. No. Um, having said that, I fully appreciate what he and Jeremy have done. They've tried to steady the ship, but that, it's not just a defensive offer. You've got to have a positive, uh, forward-looking offer as well. So, so it sounds to me like you are accepting some responsibility yourself. A, a little bit. I mean, I just think. I mean, I've always felt that you know, if you if you're going to reform something, I've always been a gradualist. I'm always somebody who's thinking, well, actually, we've got to do this. Uh, step by step, and I've said that repeatedly. Um, but I think the, the insight that Liz had was absolutely 100% right. I don't think we're going to grow this economy by increasing taxes. Guys, we've got to talk about the weekend. Yeah, because sure. Because what an amazing weekend this has been for Britain. Can we start with, uh, I guess, the political star to emerge from the coronation, your colleague? Oh, she Amy was fantastic. Morden. She was fa <laughs> I mean, I don't know how heavy that sword is, but it looked very, very heavy. Yes. And I have to say, she carried it uh, as though it was a, a feather. I mean, she had so much. <laughs> but not only strength, there was huge dignity yeah. and poise. And I've known Penny. I mean, she's, not, she's a, a friend of mine. She's someone I've always respected. Um, and I, I've seen her perform brilliantly in the public spotlight. I mean, she does, there's this rather technical, geeky thing called sec, uh, seconding the uh, royal, uh, mm. the king's, or the queen's speech, what was it? Mm. Um, and uh, she did that brilliantly. I mean, it was, it was about seven or eight years ago. And I did it myself, not nearly as well as, as her. Um, but she's always been mm. a very good performer, and she does a very good job as leader of the House. Well, I mean, the bookies have cut her odds oh, have on they? becoming a future Prime Minister. Could you see Mordaunt and Number 10 one day? Look, she's, she's run twice. Um, I think she's got, gotten pretty close both mm. times. She's obviously upped her profile. I think she's likeable. Um, and let's see what happens. But having said all of that, we have got a prime minister and we've got a general election to fight yes. in less than 18 months or in about 18 months. I, I also want to talk to you about this, this astonishing moment on Woke ITV. This is where the British actress Adjoa Ando spoke about the, the balcony being terribly white. Have a look at this okay. and I'll get you to react off the bat. Uh, there is a bit of me that we've gone from the uh, the, uh, the rich diversity of the Abbey to a terribly white balcony. I'm very <laughs> struck by yes. that. I'm also looking at those younger generations and thinking, uh, what are the nuances that they will inhabit as they grow? Um, nuances that, that uh, uh, Charles has exhibited from, a, 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 you know, a teenage into early 20s. Terribly white, quasi. Yeah, Was look, that racist? Uh, look. There are a certain group of people, not many in this country as a proportion, who are absolutely obsessed with race. And there's nothing, I'm afraid, that the royal family or anyone can do to stop them howling and accusing everyone of being racist. That's just a fact of life. There are lots of diverse voices and there is a core of people, a minority, that will, that will jump on things like that. It's divisive, isn't it? I think it's very divisive. I actually looked at the coronation and thought they did a lot uh -huh. to celebrate diversity. Um, I've had the honour of meeting King Charles mm -hmm. now when he was Prince of Wales. Um, and it, there isn't 
a man who is more concerned mm. about promoting diversity, about promoting inclusion, about mm. you know, hugging the diverse cultures of this country, its traditions, not only here, but also in the Commonwealth. Mm. And I think he would find it very hurtful. Mm. But as I've said, there's always people who are you know, going to pick holes and, and try and tear things and down. And on the whole, this was a wonderful weekend. It was Christmas. great. It was fantastic. I mean, I, I go abroad and people marvel. Mm. Uh, and friends of mine were WhatsApping from all sorts of places saying, this is incredible. You guys do an amazing job. There's no other country mm. that can do this. And I just hope and wish that people would celebrate that. Indeed.